Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. All the glory and honor to the one who made of nothing a something. We were all a nothing. Say I was a nothing. Now I'm a somebody. Just thank the Father. Just thank the Father. Father, thank you that, you, that I can call you Father. Yes, it's one, to- one thing to talk about the Father, but the, th- the, the, the real thing is knowing the Father. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Just praise him and glorify his name. <laughs> Hallelujah. I nearly, I, I, I nearly asked Pastor Dan, immediately when they were singing, I want you to come. No greetings, no nothing. Because the key word tonight in the singing was presence. Presence. You can manufacture a presence. That's what we used to do, we traditional Pentecostals. But we need the real presence. If we want to make a difference in this world, we need the presence. It's no, it's no good to talk about Jesus if they don't see Jesus. I used to preach about releasing the aroma. It's no good to talk about Jesus if they can't smell it. Therefore, it's for me, I'm very much an honor to stand in front of you. And I, even if I've done that for 40 years, I always tremble a little because it must be him seen in me. And I believe at this stage, we don't need to hear any more Carl Sanders' voice. If you can not hear the Father's voice in my voice, it means nothing I do or say. We are moving into a period where people want to see the real God. They want to experience. They want to experience. They don't want to just hear. It's no good to say. You know, I remember many years ago in Holland, uh, people are, you know how people are, they are very radical. And I wanted to be very holy, and I came like a true pastor with the Bible. And I said, oh, God is here. God is here. We used to do that. And all of a sudden, someone jumped up and said, where is he? (laughs) Hello. The presence. You know what? We are going to sit down just now. The presence means, if the presence is in you, not on a Sunday evening or a Sunday morning, it needs to be all the time with you. Then you become a grace carrier. And where you move, and where you move, you release grace. You know what? You don't, strictly speaking, don't need healing meetings because when the grace is in you and you pass the sick and it's going to happen in time to come, that people will find healing. Because what's in you, you release. Say, thank you, Father. Need more of that grace. I want to be your instrument. Now, remain standing. Because I want you, I only decided an hour ago, I want you together with me and you, or you and me, we are going to read the scripture. So an hour ago, uh, Henny, I talked to Henny or Pastor Henny or whatever, you know. I don't believe in titles. Uh, I'm Carl. They call me Papa. That's okay. The days of titles and the titles, it's all gone. We need him. We need, we need him. Because I am what I am because of him. Yes. So, and I felt, yeah, because I don't know why, and I think what you're going to read will filter through the message also. But I was highly inspired by yesterday morning's breakfast meeting when Don, Dan, Pastor Dan, or Dan, brought a very plain, simple message. Even this morning, If you haven't been here this morning, you better get the tape. Never mind that Jesus is coming, but there were things said we need to know and understand and do. Because, forgive me, I'm running away anyhow tomorrow. We have overemphasized salvation grace. But together with salvation grace, there are responsibilities and commitments. And we need more people who are committed to the task assigned to us.
Can you put us Matthew 5? You don't need the Bible. It will be there. Are you ready to read together with me? Okay, I like that. What we do in Africa lately, I'm teaching the pastors. Start with reading the word. Let somebody read the word. Never mind where he reads. But let the people stand and read together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me tell you why you are here. You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors. The what? The what? Next one. If you lose your saltiness, what do you lose? Or you can lose? How will people taste godliness? You have lost your usefulness and will end up? Next verse. Here's another way to put it. Hello, hello, hang on, hang on. Here's another way to put it. One, two, three. You are here to be light. Bringing out the... The... In the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We are going public with this. As public as a city on the hill. Next one. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Oh, next one. Now that I've put you on a light, hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Say again, shine. Say to the person next to you, shine. Say to the other person next to you, you have to shine more. Shine, shine. Okay, one, two, three. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Next one. Be opening up to others and you will prompt people to open up with God, the generous Father in heaven, completing God's law. Hallelujah. You can be seated. You can be seated. Now, I want to show you something. I'm not going to talk much about Africa because you had a lot of missions speaking to you. And I'm African. Unfortunately, I have a little wrong color, but I'm an African. But you know, I need to say this. I don't know if Mama likes it, but I need to say this. The word unity is twice in the Bible. And those who are very clever in Greek and Hebrew and the previous languages, you will, they will, when you start, start studying it, you will discover that the word is wrongly translated. The word unity needs to be replaced with the word oneness. Say oneness. oneness. It's no good to say if you are united means nothing because you can still be in uh, an, an inaccurate alignment. You can still look down at people. When you are one, when we as a family of God are one, we don't even see color. Hello? We in this church, let's call this church, but strictly speaking, you church. But we need to be one. If we are not one, we will not accomplish very much. But we need to be one. Because there is power in the many made one. There is power and the many made one. Now in Africa, I tell them, brothers, we need to work. I don't mind what church they are. I work with all of them. Even Moravians and Anglicans. There is oneness. Now in Africa, we, we, we work with meters. Now, I know you work with, with feet and yards and what they call this other inches. Now, this represents one meter, and I think in your language is 3.4 feet. Okay? So this is 100. Right? 100. Say 100 is 100 centimeter and so many inches. But let me, say, let me illustrate or say this represents years, 100 years. Okay? Now, I am 76. See where I came from. I am 76, so this is that way I came. Okay, I didn't, I don't know, I don't know, I didn't know the Lord before I was 30. But I'm 76, and say, 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 the average is 80. Okay, that means there is so much left of my life. 
I want you to see something. There's only this much of left of my life. But I've not planned yet to die. I am planning, even in what is left, to make a difference. To transfer more of him in me to others. But no, this is the key. Some of you are only 30. See, if you are, say you are 30, and the average, have a look how much is left. Can you see how much is left? Even if you are 40, huh? you think you're old when you're 40? Have a look how much is left. I believe still much can be done. I believe we need to stop being negative about America and negative about the situation in America. That's rubbish. We need to become more positive because God is in control. The world does not belong to the devil. The world belongs to God. But you see, yes, we spoke about Jesus will come. Yes, he will come. And I don't worry when and how. But he for surely will not come for a losing weak group of people. And I also believe if we talk about, Pastor Jim quoted I think this morning the Lord's prayer about the kingdom. The kingdom has to be established on this earth. And it can only be established when the true sons of God, because we read in Romans 14, of Romans 8 verse 14 and 19, and Galatians, and in 1 John 3, we, should, we need to, strictly speaking, let me put it straightforward to you. We need to stop being children and start growing. Yeah. And become sons, because the true sons will be the reason that people will see God. It's about God, it's not about me. So, what the, that what is done, the will of God in heaven. What is done in heaven needs to be done on earth. So we need to bring down, we need to bring heaven down to earth. Hello? We need to make this heaven. But brother, I nearly said that's a hell of a job. But it's going to be done with you or without you. You make the choice. You make the choice. That's the key. It's going. The other day I stood in Dar es Salaam. And Dar es Salaam is the capital city of Tanzania on the east coast, on the ocean. And there came a very big oil tanker. Maybe 200 yards. Those are enormous ships. And some of you only see the, 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 a little of what comes above the water. It's loaded with oil. And I was thinking that ship is going the direction south towards the bottom of Africa all along the coast. But all of a sudden the captain of that oil tanker gets a message. Come back to Mombasa. So that means while he is going that way, he needs to turn around and come back. And then I spoke to people and did some little investigation. And they told me, for such a ship to turn around, it takes between 13 and 16 miles. Let me tell you, this ship, we only talk about all the problems we have and the churches who are falling apart and others falling from the bandwagon. Things are getting hopeless according to many. But brother, I am seeing this mighty ship turning. It's going to turn with you or without you. You choose. It's your choice. All we need to remember, we are not here to come on a Sunday to church and sing hallelujah, praise the Lord. We are not here to attend many church services. We are here for a reason. And one of the biggest problems is, you see, I don't know why I didn't plan to speak like this. But while I sat there, I realized, even if I'm, I'm 40 years in the ministry, but I've never grown so much as in the past four years. Me and my wife Vivia, mama they call her in Africa, we have grown in four years like I've never grown before. That doesn't mean what we used to do in the past was wrong. No, no, the past brought us this far. But how many of you know what worked in the past will not work? And 
better even more in the future. So, but anyhow, I learned so much. And one thing I learned, we need, and we have been hearing that yesterday morning, and even this morning, it's about getting back to the Word. Not theology. Because you can have a, what they call this high grade beer. I grow doctor's grad. PhD. You can have a PhD, I know. In theology and yet not know God. Yes. I'm sorry. In Swahili we say Samahantla. <laughs> Forgive me. But brother, it's time. And I love you people tonight. Even this place is not full. But the kind of people here on a Sunday evening tells me they have a desire to hear more of God. And have more of God. That's why you are here. And even, even, even it's just you. Even if it is just you, or even as a half of you present who want to walk and are close or are willing to pay the price to come into an accurate alignment with God. I'll talk about that on Tuesday evening. We need to come in an accurate alignment. You know what that means? We need to get back in line with God. We talk about it, but I'm talking now about the accurate because you can be very like this and you can speak in tongues and clap hands and dance and that, not yet be in alignment with God. That's the time where we are in. Never mind where we came from. That was not wrong. But if we want to make a difference in the years to come and help the ship to turn, it's going to turn with you or without you. You choose. We need more men. And God does no gender, so we call about men. We need more who go back to the word. Take time. Take time. The Bible is not there for reading. The Bible is there for studying. The Jew, uh, what is it, what they call such a guy, rabbi, said one day, Yeah, we know you guys. You read the Bible. But we look at it until it jumps in me. You see, we need to hear God. That's why it's good to come and listen to messages as you have been hearing. If they speak the word, which is clear word, plain, simple word, and we take time to explain and make people to understand the various meanings and what is God saying, because we need to focus on revelation knowledge. Not what some books say and some other people said on TBN. We need to hear God. So it, it, it's about hearing. Nothing else. It's not about talking. It's not about preaching and teaching. It's about hearing. Accurate hearing. But I believe, and I'm still not there where I need to go and my time is against me. I have spiritual warfare again with the watch. I know I forget what I wanted to say. <laughs> you know, I believe, now listen carefully. I believe there is a time, we're already there. We are in a different season, we need to understand that. Yeah. The past was good. Even in America today, the winter starts, or somehow. So we came out of the summer, we talk about seasons. I can talk about three hours about seasons. Why do we have seasons? We are the Pentecostal season. We had a, a, a charismatic season. We had all those seasons, but we are now in a season where God wants to bring. You know, that's why you see there is also a cleaning process. God will work. You don't need to work. Forget about working for Jesus. He wants to do the work through you. Yes. Yeah. I too many times in my past. Even me used to tell God, okay, God, you sit the towel, fix it for you. And I've always been fixing. For, I wasn't, I, I've never been afraid. Wherever I go, even along, I nearly landed in jails and been persecuted. We can write books about it. I'm not afraid of any devil. But I said to God, don't worry. But many of the things we did was not God things. Now we need to come in alignment and start doing what God says. The things of God, not the things of somebody. Hello? So, 
I've learned a lot. It's about the word. The word. It's about God. No. I, I, I didn't know I'm going to say it. I've been sat on bed this afternoon. And this is a kind of a type of a prophecy. Let's call it a word which is in line with that what I've already said. You must listen carefully. The Lord is awakening us. You hear what I'm saying? We are moving in a time, or already in a time, that God is awakening you. God, the Lord is awakening us to who we are. Why we are. Who we are. Hello? He has a purpose for, for each of us to fulfill his purpose on earth. Not in heaven. On earth. We have to bring heaven down. It's no good I, I talk about heaven and people cannot experience heaven in my life. Hello? God created heaven and earth. And I like what I think Dan, Pastor Dan said tonight. Never mind where I die, where I go. I want to go where God is. Yes. It's about going where God is. Correct? Amen. Now listen to this. God wants us to understand that our destiny is to become many fasted sons in the kingdom. In other words, our job is not just singing and clapping or attending what. It's revealing Opening up the truth that people can see, people can hear, can experience. Here is a true man of God. You don't need to say, I'm reborn. You don't need the sticker on the car, I'm reborn. Look inside the car. <laughs> like we've heard this morning. It's about, how do you know? Okay, how do you know somebody is reborn? It's not because he comes to church or he fell on the ground. This is not the signal of that they've been reborn. But the key to knowing that someone has accepted the Lord as his personal savior is lifestyle. It's lifestyles. You know? And I like Pastor Jim and others are going to talk more about faith. You know, some of us all think we know is we always talk about faith, 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 faith. But you know, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because faith and obedience go hand in hand. Amen. If you want an increase of faith, so that when in the times when you are down, and you are in the pot, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> you must know, you must still have faith. You know? Even if you're doing very well, you don't even know how much money you got in the bank and you got a couple of motor cars and a swimming pool on top of the house. You must still have faith. Hello? Because it's not all about faith. I have a teaching. I don't know, I thought I was going to talk about it, but I'm not. Tuesday. It, this obedience and faith, the more you develop that, the more anointing you will have. And we traditional people, we think anointing is running upside up and jumping and shouting. And go, look at it. Ah, there's an anointing. No, there's no anointing. There's performance. But the more anointing you have, the presence, the more glory will operate through you. So it's obedience and faith. Anointing, glory. We need to come. I like this morning the word likeness was explained. Very nice. But you can, there's a, a longer word. Likeness is a longer word as image. Image is you look like God. All right? You talk like God. You walk like God. All right? The image. Image has to do with glory. We need to have his presence which makes you shine. It's glory. So, now, again I'm saying something I should have not said. If, 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 you, if you go to, uh, you know, we, we have been focusing 
in the last year or two, that doesn't mean I'm clever, okay? <laughs> I only know certain, uh, I know nothing. But let me see if I can go there. And I need to uh, not waste time to going somewhere where I might not get. But I want to read something to you. It's in Genesis chapter 1. You know, we maybe need to learn to go back to in the beginning. In the beginning. That's why I said the Lord is awakening us, awakening us to who we are and why we are who we are. Most people have lost their identity. They don't know who they are. Brother, you can sing in tongues and you can jump up and down the aisles and you can be slain or fall on the ground. Means nothing. If you do not know who you are. You see, that's, that's where we need to go. If you know who you are, you are a grown up child because the Bible talks about children. And children need to grow. It's time that some of our people who have been baptized 40 years ago, but they're still sucking. Not here, at another place. <laughs> but hey, we need to grow, isn't it? How do you grow? You don't grow by, by singing more and giving more money. Growing is by getting in the Word and hearing what God says. Spending time in the word. And you know what I like the most? The Lord, the Lord, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, etc. You know that one. So it was evening and morning on the third day. And then we go to chapter 2, sorry. Then the Lord said, then the Lord said, that's not me who said, Lord said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds, over the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps. Okay, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over, etc. You know that part. Now that part does not just mean we must make more children. He planted himself in you. He planted a seed in you. And that seed, that seed must be transferred. You know, we are here to transfer seeds, to give seeds so that people can grow. Now, God blessed them and he said, prosper and reproduce, fill the earth. It's no good that we keep on making children, but our children are lost. I wanted to talk about Hannah and about Samuel and about David. And it looks like I'm not getting there. But you know, we must become aware of that. How important are young people? How important are children? Because I believe, according to Psalm 102 and other places, a generation yet to be born yet to be born will do the finishing job. So somewhere, even if we don't see the finishing job, even if we don't see the ship already totally and going in the right direction, that's okay. But we have been even hearing this morning, we are here to lay that platform, to make it that our children, and if I see those little children from, from, from Pastor Dan, and uh, Yolandi's children, they are small. Who says, if out of them, you must remember that God is a timeless God. Do you understand that? So that's why we needed to hear that he will come. But we don't know when. God's a timeless God. God has no time. God has time, no time. The job will be done with you or without you. But there is a generation coming. 
But we need to prepare that generation. And we can only prepare that generation not by quoting verses and singing songs, by transferring the truth in our own life. They need to hear it in the family. They need to, ex they need to hear the father and the mother praying and calling upon the Lord. They need to see you reading scripture. They need to see you doing what is good which will feed them. You see, we have been, we come out of a past where we even force children to be baptized and they don't know why they are baptized. We come out of a time where we took young people and even taught them how to speak in tongues. Start kutarakatetede. That's where we come from. Maybe some of you can remember that. But that means nothing. We need, they need to experience the peace and the presence of God in the house. That is what they, what they see, they carry. What they see, they experience. And that is what I wanted to say when I lost track because I was looking at the man that said, oh God, help me. I believe we're moving in a time not just of hearing, but seeing. You know, when John was at Patmos, poor John, they had taken out his eyes. And I don't know, one day he must have been standing, I don't know where he was standing, and maybe he looking that direction, although he could not see. And all of a sudden he, he heard a voice behind him. And the Bible says in Revelation, I think 1.12, and he turned around and saw. Listen, we need to hear the word that clear. When Samuel said, here I am. The scripture, I was going to read that. But time. He jumped up. He must, well, I think so. It's not 100% written. But the Bible says, and he stood. You think Samuel remained lying down? I don't think so. God spoke to him five times. You can go and count it. I was counting it again. I used to say, uh, when I prepared this message, I, I did somewhere uh, introduction four times but then I found out it's really five times because then God spoke now what is so beautiful of this story of Samuel you know he grew up in the church let's call it the church but everything in the church in the room where he was sleeping next to that room there was corruption no, that's what I've heard this morning when we were together in the office or yesterday, I can't remember. And when you open up the, 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 the magazines and charisma and whatever you read, I don't know what you guys all read, but you see every day a lot of nonsense what is taking place and a lot of half-truths because we come out of an era, forgive me for saying it, we have been hearing half-truths, we have been preaching things which pleases the ear of people. We have been focusing on grace, and I call it greasy grace. But we need to get an alignment to hear the accurate word. And not just preach it, but break it in such a manner that people can follow it. That people can feel it. That people can understand it. It's no good to say to all of you, praise the Lord, hallelujah, Amen. It just remains, praise the Lord, hallelujah, Amen. But there needs, we, there needs to be a change which doesn't come from the outside. We can do all the platforms. But what needs to take place is from the inside out. Yeah. I also fabricated many things. I've been a pastor, not a pastor from a church, only a few years. But I learned a lot. I did many things. And there was a lot of performance. There were even times if they didn't fall, I made them to fall. Go to Africa, then you see that. Ask them. You see things you cannot believe. But guess what? You know, that's why I don't... You must forgive me if I say this. I don't believe in mass evangelism. Because I can prove to you, not even 1% are saved. Really saved in mass crusades. But that's okay. That's all right. We did those things. And it worked somehow. 
We have seen it. But we need to take these people. And we cannot just leave them. We need to take them somewhere. But if you want to take them somewhere, then you need to know, where is that somewhere? What must I do? Because it's not how many people we've got in the church. It's not how many people sing on loud voices, praise the Lord, hallelujah. No. At the end of the day, I've been teaching the leaders and the pastors in the past few years. Put them on a scale. Because success is not measured in how many people come. Listen. Listen. I've seen small churches who make a bigger impact as the ones who've got 5,000. Because in Africa, we also made mistakes. We taught them like that. It's all about money, it's about titles, about bodyguards. And today, we've got 453 million Christians in Africa. Unbelievable, far over 60%, yet we kill one another, yet there is corruption, yet there is so much things happening. So much. It's unbelievable. But yet I believe, you know what I believe? I believe Africa will be one of the continents who will be the reason that the ship turns faster. Africa. You know why? We've got good people in Africa. Don't think they are stupid. Forget about it. They are the most wonderful people. The best people. They love the, But you know, if you have not taught them, they love anything. That's why they can worship a thing in the tree. They say it has a spirit. We don't understand that. But those people, when you help them, and you, you see, that's why we did many good things in the past, but with the things we had to do, we didn't do. And you can even see that in South Africa, where things have been declining tremendously. While we had all the opportunities to invest in people and lift them up and make something out of them, we didn't do it. Now if you go, oh, everybody knows Soweto. Everybody in the world knows where Soweto is. They don't know where Johannesburg is, they know where Soweto is because everything started there. Two million plus people. You know, before or during apartheid, nearly 80 percent plus went to church. Today, it's not even 11% of the people swear to go to church. Hana means grace. Hana didn't worry. She knew things are not right. At that stage, the whole place was falling apart because of the sons of Eli or Eli. They were wicked. The man who was more concerned, he was the man, he, Eli or Eli, how you pronounce it. The man who is more concerned about the honor of his sons than the honor of God is sure to bring a holy cause into mockery. But Hannah did not know. Maybe she knew that one day she would be the reason that those things will be exposed. Because long before Samuel was born, already a man, you can read, and you must read 1 Samuel chapter 1, 2, and 3. One man, and chapter 2, verse 27, starts, a, a man of God had no name. Nobody said where he came from, or whatever. He only came to Eli, Eli, or Eli. And he said what was going to happen. Because he said, God is not, is not in favor for what is happening. So he actually brought a bad prophecy. But never mind. Little did she know that our son would expose the concept of priest order to Eli. What we learn from Hannah, I need to say it this morning. She was sorrowful because she was childless. Now the scripture tells me, behold, children are the heritage from the Lord. But Psalm 127 verse 3 says, the fruit of the womb is a reward. In other words, she felt ashamed that she was barren. Too many, 
Too many, not here at another place. Let's call them Christians. They are better. They're only good on a Sunday morning and I think after they finish the service they go to heaven. Hey, we need to get rid of this barrenness. We even heard it this morning. Have it in your mouth. and take that, Let that word, word come out of your mouth. She was mocked. She was prayerful. She vowed. She said, God, give me a son and I will give him back to you. She believed. She brought her burden to the Lord and she went away without eat. Brothers and sisters, you know, many of us, we come. And then sometimes in the past when we gave altar calls for people who have problems to come or join the Holy Communion table, you know, we come with the problems, we sit on the table, we eat and drink from the table, and when we leave, we take the same problems with me. What else? But it's time that we come and leave the problems with him and get out. You see, that's what we can learn from her. So she left. But what I like the most is, can you put that on? I think we got it in the New King James Version. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 1. But above all, she was joyful. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. What needs to come back, we need to smile again like we said out of the first readings. We need to have again, we need to come back and really rejoicing. Don't just come on a Sunday and be motivated by this beautiful music and the choir and what they've been singing. It was wonderful, but that same song hey, must be on you. Wherever you go, we heard this morning, in the bathroom, in the motor car, wherever you go, I even sit on the toilet and I praise God. Hello, we need to start praising again because there is power and joy. But if you walk around with all the troubles on your shoulders, my, 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 my. That carried her through. Her prayer was answered. A testimonial was given. She said to Elia, remember the woman a couple of years ago whom you were actually thinking I was drinking wine? This is the woman who's here. God has answered you know, we're here, we need, it's good to have sometimes some of the testimonials recorded because people need to know that the same God who did great things for Carl Sanders can do great things for you. We need, we need to start looking, oh, it's only done for him, it's only done for her, it's all there, it's, it's, it, it's there. You only need to know the Lord, you need to have more of him, his presence. Her power lies light in the presence. He's, her, her strength. You see, the horn means, the horn means the strength, the honor, the rulership, the dignity, the fertility was in the horn. Rejoicing in the Lord. Yes, her vow was performed. Maybe we've got this, uh, one Samuel 128. She paid her vow. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord together. Can you understand? As from a woman who went through so much issues and problems in her life, made a fool of her, a laughing stock of her, she gave birth to a son. His name was Samuel. His name means heard of God, asked of God. We must understand, in your houses, there are Samuels. In this church, there are Samuels. Hello? I might not be there, I said, when I'm 84. That, that little piece is left. But hey, there are many who will carry on where I left. You need to prepare for those who carry on when you're not anymore able to. You need to invest in the samples crawling on the ground. When I saw the little baby today again, oh, he's so joyful. I've never seen such a sweet little boy. You know? And the other one is singing choruses. And I realize... If they grow up in this atmosphere, 
They become vessels, an instrument of change. Because Hannah, Hannah was, yeah, let me rather say this way. The key to everything, and why I focus on Hannah, I believe Hannah was a part of the remnant. I wish I could speak longer about the remnant. Maybe we can just give you the last part, the meaning of a remnant. But she prepared. She was the one who gave birth to Samuel, who became one of the greatest prophets ever in history. The one who anointed kings. The one who brought accurate prophecies. She gave birth to a son who became the remnant of that time. Listen, that time, if you take a study, and I'm not clever with all that, but there are wonderful books which can describe what the world and the condition the world was in those days. You know what? We are the same. We are at the moment at the place in this world. And what is happening in this world has, happening, has been happening in that time. Therefore, I believe you need to be, or you, or some of most, or all of you, a part of a remnant. A remnant. Never mind if we have 300 or 400 million people in America and only, and only 10 million serve the Lord. That's okay. It can only be 1 million and America can change. But we need those people who are part of a remnant. The ones who are willing to be a dirty cloth or a towel in God's hand so that they can start wiping because things can change through a remnant. And that is why we need to become part of that remnant. There was a little girl. A little story I want to tell you quickly because it's pumpkin time and I hate those orange pumpkins. Don't bring me a pumpkin tart. There was a little girl who hated eating pumpkin. One day she came home smiling. When I asked why, she replied, I got rid of the last pumpkin. I buried its seed. The story illustrates the total hopelessness of the devil when God said, listen what God said, and I will put a mighty between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15 The death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus created a nightmare for the enemy. I don't want to en 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 endorse something but the, the enemy is also there. Also for a reason. But let me I don't want to talk about that one. You see the enemy, the enemy is still around, but we've got the power. Yes. We've got it. Yes. But then you have to have it. It's no good to sing, send us a revival, Lord, or give us more power, Lord. But it's in you. You need to understand if you are an accurate alignment, you hear him, you see him, you know what he is saying. There's power. And that power in you is uh, generates or catalyzes. You know what I like in, 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 in Coloss Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. The Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that hope, that what is in you is a, cat a catalyst. So all of God was vested in this one seed. The word of God in creation. The remnant is vitally important because the remnant is the carrier of the seed. The Christ. If you're part of the remnant, a seed. The seed has in it the original image and nature of God. We, the sons of the seed, are hidden with Christ in God. In God. So your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3. My time is up, but let me just, just give you an explanation of the word remnant. I wanted to speak so much about three times Eli said, I didn't call you. The second time he said, go back. The third time he said, lie down. 
we know these things. Special some of our older guys, we know that some of those holy guys who've been 40 years ago baptized, they will tell you you're too small or you are too young. You need to have first Bible college certificate and all that nonsense. I believe those are the three things the enemy always tells the called of God. You are called, you are not called. Just go back and lie down, says Elijah, says Eli. I say, enough, wake up. Wake up, Samuel. You are not an oops or an accident. You are the voice of God, of God's plans to use. And God has a word for you to declare no more slumber, no more living in your life and a dizziness. So what I'm saying is it's time that we should arise and come in an accurate alignment of hearing, seeing him and his presence on us. Now, I want to close with this so they can help me. The word remnant. I know most of us are part of a remnant. Those who have grown in the Lord, who are sure who they are, start seeing you as a remnant. But there are many future remnants in your house. Hello? There are many future remnants in the streets, wherever you go. And the remnant needs to bring them in so that they also become part of the remnant. You, you copy that one? Because I can't explain better. Now let's go quickly to the dictionary.com. Defines it as remaining what is left over. Usually a small part or a fragment or scrap unsold, unused piece of cloth as at the end of the bowl, the next one. What means in Old and New Testament, what remains of a group of people after most of that group has been destroyed or lost through dispersal, brought upon, just, upon judgment or the falling, flowing of apostasy. In other words, remnant is a wreck in the hand of God, waiting to be used to clean up the mess. If we say our country is in a mess, then it is your time to stand up. And you will be used, even if you are going to be a piece of cloth. God wants to use that piece of cloth, you, to help to clear up the mess. That's why we are here for. And God is going to do it with you or without you. It's your choice. Now, lastly, even the Apostle Paul used to say, or said in Romans 11 verse 5, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. By grace. And the reality is Paul lived in a time much like today. Hello? Much like today. Now, we are living in a time where many key voices have grown faint of heart due to the fact that truth is not considered. Hello? Hate, speech, and passion for Jesus is considered normal, mess normal. Simply put, I believe that to take a stand for truth means you might be ostracized. Ostracized. And even mistreated. God is sounding a clarion call for his remnant to rise up and lead. The remnant must come back to combat the false message of crazy Greece and what I call secular Christianity. That's why I don't even like the word Christianity because we are not Christians. We are children of God. We are sons of God. We need to be becoming true sons of God who can translate, transfer his presence. Now, I'm going to close. I asked them to do that for me. But the problem is, we have lost our identity. I believe it's now time for the nobodies to rise up and declare truth or through the power of the Holy Spirit as God has raised up remnants at the critical moments right through the history. 
right through the history, there were remnants who helped us where we are today. In the final conclusion, I must say it, otherwise I will not be satisfied with myself. Here somewhere in 1 Samuel chapter 3, God called for Samuel, and he said for Samuel, Samuel, I am tired. I'm fed up of Saul. I'm finished. Take a horn. Make it full of oil. And go to the house of Jess. In conclusion, there's a really conclusion. <laughs> I see three kinds of people in that verse. Saul. Yesterday's man. Samuel. Today's man. David, tomorrow's man. Even here, we've got too many yesterday's people and we need to help them. Otherwise, it's okay. You can come and still give your offerings or we're fine. We want to operate with the ones who want to move on, want to become today's people who invest in the future people. You know what? Saul had a crown. He was still king. David was anointed king, had no crown. Hello? You don't need the crown. If you know who you are, you're wearing already the crown. Let's just lift the hands and praise God. Just praise God and say, yes, God, I want to be part of a remnant. I want to be part of a remnant. Say, yes, I want to. I want you to hear saying it. Say, yes, Lord, here I am. Here I've heard tonight, with you or without you, but I want to be part of you. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask everybody to just remain seated. When I get a couple more minutes of your time, then I'm going to let you go, okay? First of all, did you guys get something from the Word of the Lord tonight? It was amazing. You can understand why Carl, since we're losing titles, uh, why he is able to do what he does. Because it's just like our pastor, just like our church, in your face, going to tell you like it is. And tonight, I need to talk to some of you guys and get in your face a little bit. Because you heard the Word tonight. And you're saying to yourselves, am I really a Christian? You're examining your heart and your life and you're saying, I'm in church. I, I can quote scriptures. I, I know who God is. And yet tonight when you heard the word, you, you took a look at yourself and you took inventory and you said, uh, you know, when he talked about weighing people on the scale, would I measure up as a Christian? Would I measure up as a child of God. Jesus came and he said these words. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, like I said, guys, I need a couple more minutes of your time. I'm going to ask everybody, please remain seated. We'll let you go in a couple minutes. Your kids are fine. They're, they're having the time of their life over there in the children's and youth ministries right now. So just give me a couple more minutes and then I'll let you go. So everybody, please give me your attention. Your eternal destiny is at stake right now. Jesus said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, Hollywood, television, movies, books, the internet, all define that as weirdo, goofy stuff. Many people turn off and they say, I don't want to have anything to do with that born again stuff. And yet, let's not let the world define for us what being born again means. Being born again has always meant the same thing. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church. Proves to me that not everyone who is in church that calls himself a Christian is really a Christian. Because he says to this church, he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What is he saying? Lukewarm. What's lukewarm Christianity? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to give God all of your heart and all of your life so that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a child of God. Now you're being born again into the family of God. Give Him all of your heart and all of your life. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and I'm going to slap my hand on this pulpit. Bang! 
When you hear the sound of my hand slap on this pulpit, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, pastor. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's get over that today. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than to stand up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. No one's that dumb, and yet the devil thinks that you are. He thinks that you're, you're an idiot and that he can talk you out of it right now. He's trying to push you out of this right now. That's why I'm pushing hard to get you into this right now. It's because I love you, and I want to see your life changed. I want to see you in heaven, not end up in hell. Tonight, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight is your night. Make sure. Who should raise their hand? You've never done this. Never given God all your heart. Never given God all your life. I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You're ready to get your hand up and make a right relationship with God, acknowledging your need for Jesus. All across this auditorium, back in the family room, wherever you're at, you're watching my television in the foyer or in the Love Rock Cafe or online across the nation and around the world, wherever you're at. You're ready to get your hand up. God sees, and then you can click the button that says respond to God right next to your browser or on our homepage, how to know God. And someone will lead you in a prayer wherever you're at. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hand. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hand. Just raise it up high right now for me. You need to give God all of your heart. need to give God all of your life. Thank you. There's one back in the family. Who else tonight? Need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Come on, just raise it up high for me. Come on, you know you need to give God all your heart and all of your life. Don't play games with God tonight. He didn't play games with you. He went to the cross, beaten, bloody, open spectacle for all to see. He loves you so much. Now he's saying you don't get to heaven just by sitting in church. Don't get to heaven just by being good. Don't get to heaven because you were raised in church or you got involved or sang in a choir. You get to heaven because you give God all of your heart and all of your life. Thank you. And the family, you can put your hand down. I know it's hard to keep it up that long. Thank you. But God bless you. We'll, we'll help you out in a moment. If that's you, come on. Don't mess with God tonight. This is real. You heard an in-your-face message. And if you're wondering, am I, am I really saved? Do I need to do this? Yeah, you need to. Come on. Come on. Just examine your heart right now. You know who you are. Just pop it up high. I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass them. Thank you. There's another one in that family. God bless you. Who else tonight? Don't clap. Come on. Let's just give you a moment. If you need to do this, just lift your hand up high for me. Anybody else? We've got two wise people already. Anybody else real quick? I'm going to close this up. i got to let you go. Thank you. There's three. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss. You've missed enough opportunities in life. Don't let this pass you by. Come on. Who else tonight? There's three wise people already. You're saying, I know I need to do this. Anybody else? Come on, just raise it up high for me. Last call, and then I'm cutting it off. Anybody else real quick? Just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Last call, last sweep through. There's three wise people already. Will you join them tonight? Giving God all your heart and all of your life. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for three wise people. All right, all three of you, or number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. And when we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. No one leaves during this time. Remember, we're going to let you go in a minute. But let's do this. Let's let them come. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. We're going to change destinies tonight. Can't do that until we get you down here. So you just come right now and make your way to the front. Come on down. Come on down. Let's give them a hand clap. Let's give them a cheer. Jesus, and you come right now. Come on, come on, come on. And you need to give Jesus, God all your heart, need to give God all your life. Come on down to you. You're the reason that from the failures, you can bring your children down. They'll remember this. Come on down. Come on down. They're coming. They're coming. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong to you. Come on down right now. Just make your way to the front. They're still coming. You can come too. Jesus, I believe. Let your neighbor right now say, Come on, friend, I'll go with you. Let's go. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong to you. Jesus, I believe. Hallelujah. 
Hey, you guys up front, look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing, all right? This is not a bad thing. Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. Right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, you go to church sometimes. You wonder, are they weird? Listen, no one's weird. He's cool. He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. He's going to give you some free information, some free literature to help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Just like you heard tonight, you know, they, they gave their heart to the Lord, but then what do they do afterwards? We want to help you, okay? We want to encourage you and help you in your walk with God. Then he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church. We call a spiritual personal trainer. It's easy. It's free. He'll describe how it works and then let you come right back out. Your friends and family that came with you, they'll wait for you, okay? Now, let me make a promise to you guys. Give us one year of your life sitting under the teaching here at the Rock Church Memorial Outreach Center, okay? Committed, consistent. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, you're going to be so blessed. You're going to say, I didn't know it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. Okay, you guys. You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.